Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Patricia Daly. I'm a professor in the School of Geography and the Environment here at the University of Oxford. I'm also a Jamaican and a Pan-African feminist. I have, it's a, therefore, it's a pleasure to be invited to facilitate the chair and chair the 10th annual Sam Sharp Lecture. In our gathering today is Professor Robert Beckford, the presenter of the first Sam Sharp Lecture, and that was hosted at the Jamaican High Commission. Subsequent lectures have been graced by luminaries such as Professor Vereen Shepherd, Dr. Joel Edwards, Bishop Rose Hudson Wilkins, and Reverend Carl Johnson, to name a few. Professor Anthony Reddy, who is here with us today, is the 2023 speaker. The lectures, birthed by Rosemary Davidson Go to Bed, a partner in the Sam Sharp project, are an embodiment of the wider Sham Sam Sharp project, led by the Jamaican Baptist Union, Baptist Together, Regent Sparks College, Rosemary Davidson Go to Bed, and Dr. Elish Lewis and the BMS World Mission. For 10 years, the lectures have grown from strength to strength, culminating in the forthcoming publication of all 10 lectures by CMN, SCM in 2023. On this lecture, the leaders of the Sham Sharp project have invited me to express appreciation to Oxford University for partnering in this lecture and to Regent Spark College and the Angus Library for producing an excellent short video on Sam Sharp. Before I hand over to Professor Beckford to introduce our speaker, Professor Kahinde Andrews, let me take this opportunity to welcome those online and those here with us at the Maths Institute and to introduce you all to a vision of colour, an anti-racist resource produced to equip Baptist ministers and their churches establish anti-racist churches. This has been initiated by the Sam Sharp Project and supported by Baptists Together. So let's now turn to the video. Hi, my name is Elisa and I am the producer of Visions of Colour, a six session video programme that aims to educate and equip Baptist ministers to develop anti-racist church spaces in Britain. This course considers six areas of Christian ministry, preaching, mission, worship, culture, theology and Bible reading. We have gathered ministers and scholars to illuminate a path towards anti-racism using various methods for doing theology, including post-colonialism and apologetics. Included in this programme are Baptist Thoughts, which are short insights from Baptist ministers from all over Britain, explorations of key concepts such as decolonisation and anti-racism, and lectures from our esteemed contributors, Dr. Paul Inyur, Reverend Dr. Israel Olofinjana, Reverend Philip Lutteret, Professor Anthony Reddy, Professor Robert Beckford and myself. These lectures are designed to explain the various ways we can engage with an anti-racist agenda and suggest various practical ideas and tips that can be applied to everyday ministry. To support the video lectures is a guidebook that includes definitions, surveys for your local church members and a guide for ministers who, alongside their congregation, can set practical and achievable goals towards anti-racism that is suitable for their particular church. I have with me leaders of the Sam Sharp Project, Reverend Wale Hudson-Roberts and Rosemary Davidson Gotebed, who will say a few words about the birth and life of visions of colour through the Sam Sharp vision. So I'll start with Reverend Wale first. And could you talk about the context in which visions of colour has been birthed, the needs that you saw and your vision for this project? It was in the aftermath of the murder of George Floyd that the Sam Sharp um, partner suggested that I have a conversation with Professor Robert Beckford, solicit his perspective on how um, Baptists can theologically reflect upon racism. And um, it was in light of those conversations that Robert and I explored a number of issues. One of the particular issues that we explored together 
concerns white privilege. Another one concerns a anti-racist resource that will take white privilege and colorblind theology seriously. And the third thing we explored was institutional racism, how it plays out, how it manifests itself, how it invalidates black and brown people. The more we spoke, the more we recognized that there is a resource here that needs to be developed, ideally by the Sam Sharp project, something that's rigorous and robust, that's theologically reflective, that calls out um, sin for what it is and seeks transformation. Um, and as a result, the visions of color resource was birthed. We identified yourself, Elysia, as the consultant. You came on board and you've done an absolutely brilliant job. And here we have it about to be launched. Wonderful, thank you. And Rosemary, can you speak a little on the impact you envision visions of colour having on those who take the course? And also Sam Sharp Project's vision for education and resource development in the community. Right, thank you. Um, from its inception, the Sam Sharp Project, when it was launched, had three mandates. One was education, research and community engagement. This piece of work, Visions of Colour, fits perfectly into the education part of that vision and that mandate. And it's our hope that this will develop and take root and so that we never find ourselves coming back to this position where people claim that they don't know, don't understand, don't have a theological um, handle or perspective on issues that are affects quite a number of our fellow brothers and sisters within this denomination and this country as a whole. So we're not just talking about calling out racism, um, but calling in change, demanding it, saying, you know, drawing a line in the sand and saying at, from this point forward, no one can ever say they did not know, they did not understand, they did not have a theological context. And that's what I want, that's what I, my, my dream is to see at the end of Visions of Colour, that we move on, not just in small steps, but huge strides that people's lives and minds are transformed, that ap apathy is not tolerated, that ignorance, willful ignorance, is not, is, is, doesn't have a home, that people are pulled and stretched to move so far out of their comfort zone that they can't find their way back. And I think Visions of Colour is the exact sort of resource that will enable this to happen. Thank you. Thank you both so much for giving us some insight into the background and the hopes for Visions of Colour. In partnership with the Sam Sharp Project has been Baptist Together, who has helped us to produce a film with Fuelcast as well, um, that production um, and film um, company to bring this video and a physical handbook resource to you. It's now available and we hope that you're going to enjoy the trailer that follows this short video. Thank you so much. Despite many churches claiming to be multicultural, the culture of many Baptist churches leaves room for concern. The ecclesiology, the theology, the structure of the church is intrinsically white. It is still um, European. And so mission came to be defined as Europeans going to other parts of the world. In many cases, the use of indigenous music was seen as devilish and therefore forbidden. The truth is, apart from a sea of black and brown faces, a good number of our Baptist churches are deeply wedded to a British way of doing church. This is where Visions of Colour comes into its own. God is a God of colour. God's creation indicates that God is a God of colour. Really, we would just want people to open their minds and hearts to the voices that have been marginalised, the voices that have been quieted, and the voices that have been ignored. The radical shift from a colorblind church to a community of Baptist believers intentionally committed to actively opposing racism is what Visions of Colour is set out to enable churches to achieve.
pleasure to you know, bring Professor Robert Beckford to um, the front because he's here to introduce our speaker for tonight, Professor Beckford. Thank you. I'm just going to say a few quick words about Kehinde Andrews. Um, but before I do that, um, I just want to say something about the people who are gathered here this evening because it must be a rarity to have four black professors in one room. I mean, that represents um, literally one uh, tenth of all the black Caribbean heritage professors within the UK. So we need to make sure that there's not a hit on us tonight or else there'll be a real serious uh, shortage of us going around. But I just think it's worth saying that because it is so hard to make it as a professor in general. And it's incredibly hard to do that as a black professor and as a professor who wants to promote issues around race and justice. So it's great mm -hmm. to be here with Professor Kindy Andrews, uh, Patricia Daly, Anthony Reddy, and myself. And I think we're, I'm sorry for people who are not from Jamaica, <laughs> but we all just happen to be of Jamaican heritage. So I just think we need to acknowledge that the Jamaicans might be doing something, uh, might be putting something in their tea, which is, uh, which is helping here. I just want to um, uh, introduce Kahindi. I just want to say there are very few academics in Britain who are willing to stick their heads above the parapet and do public intellectual work in fear of censure by their university. I just take for example the fact that at Cambridge University last week, the vice chancellor said he didn't understand decolonisation. You know, you know what you're up against, but. Kehinde Andrews isn't like that. There are very few black professors who will do public intellectual work because they recognize that just talking about race relegates their work to second class level within the academy, according to Paul Gilroy. But Kehinde Andrews isn't like that. There are very few professors who are academics who are black, who are willing to do public intellectual work and defend the black community because they're worried about the death threats that you receive once you do that kind of work. But Kehinde Andrews isn't like that. Kehinde Andrews is the professor of black studies at Birmingham City University, a post which he is the first in Britain to have and to hold. He also <coughs> initiated the first BA degree in black studies in the UK. He is the author of numerous books, most recently, I've forgotten the recent book, I haven't read that one, Kindy, sorry mate. <laughs> The New Age of Empire, it's on the reading list, how racism and colonialism still rule the world. But for me, and why I wanted to be here tonight is because three things that I admire most about Kehinde. He, he is, so Jamaican, he is? <laughs> he is courageous. He is willing to take risks to defend our community and our people. He is at times audacious. You've seen some of the stuff he's done on GMTV. It's a little bit audacious and whatever. But more than anything else, he is a brother of high intellectual ability and capability. And I am so glad to call him not only a colleague, but also a friend. So please, put your hands together and welcome Professor Kehinde Andrews. Um. Now you're going to be disappointed. So, <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you, Robert, for that. And I have to say, anybody who um, has gone through academia uh, certainly knows Robert Beckford, any black person. Uh, and without Robert Beckford, I'm probably not here, certainly. Um, supported me, my ex, my, my ex, my late wife would be the word to use. I'm here because my wife passed away recently. Um, and Robert was a big support for Nicole, Dr. Nicole Andrews as well. So, you know, look, people like Robert are really, really, really important for just getting people through and understanding. Um, also, I stole my joke about four black professors. I had a whole bit on that. I was going to start, I had it written down here. Look, four black professors, four black professors. 
No, no. Thank you, thank you. It's, not, it's, it's, it's good to be here. Um, and actually, the Sam Sharp thing was actually really an important... When, it, when I got the invitation, it was like, this is a really important invitation because I don't think I've ever heard Sam Sharp used in that sense. I've not, I don't really hear Sam Sharp's name used at all, actually, which is interesting given there is a big Jamaican um, population in the UK and we do talk about slavery regularly. And one of the things which really always gets to me when we think about slavery is, you know, is that there's this idea that to talk about slavery is to talk negatively about our people. I, I've never understood slavery like that. I was taught it very differently because I was taught about Sam Sharp and the Baptist War. I was taught about Nanny of the Maroons. I was taught about the, the Paul Bogle in what well, is after slavery, but in the kind of afterlife of slavery. Um, I learned slavery through resistance. So I, 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 I'd never heard this idea that you learn slavery, it teaches you negative things. Never, never, something that ever crossed my mind. And so Sam Sharp is somebody certainly we should be much more uh, knowledgeable about. And he's actually a really good, I'm, I'm gonna use uh, Sam Sharp's position to kind of talk through thinking about how we understand racism, how we understand blackness, how we go forward, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Because Sam Sharp is really, 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 really important and under, underplayed. So yeah, I'm gonna start. Yeah, I'm gonna start. I wanna, I'm gonna get a, a, one of these uh, walk around mics. Is it on? Do I have to, do I have to, do I have to press a button there? Yes. Because I like to feel like a um, stand-up comedian. So. <laughs> so, yeah. um, is there a clicker? Do I, can I, is that a clicker? Oh, there is. Yeah. So you're lucky I don't start drawing because I really like writing on things. Uh, but my handwriting is terrible. So, okay. I called the talk uh, Bringing Down the House. Um, and actually, think about Robert. There's a th I remember Robert gave a talk a long time ago that I remember, and it was a house Negro with a field Negro mentality. Right? And I really like that, and I come back to it a lot, uh, because this idea of the house and the field, massively important, still conceptually to how we understand, or should be conceptually, to how we understand race, racism, blackness in particular, and resistance. So my absolute favorite person in history is Malcolm X, which won't be a surprise if you've heard me talk uh, before. And I'm getting Malcolm in early, because I did a talk the other day and didn't mention Malcolm once, which has never happened in my life. So I thought it's best to start. Let's start with Malcolm and then we won't go, won't go wrong. Someone like Malcolm X is really important, um, and I'm also really happy in Oxford to start with Malcolm X, because typically when we think about intellectuals, intellectual labor, we don't think about people like Malcolm X, right? And actually, for black people in particular, when we think about our intellectual heritage, it's only recently there's been any others in universities. Mm -hmm. As Robert pointed out, it's four black professors in the room, only 150 black professors in the entire country out of 20,000. Um, and that's an improvement. Uh, that's, that's, that's better than it was two years ago. So it's only really recent that there's been any critical mass of black scholars in the university. So most of our intellectual labor has had to be done outside. Has to be done. Think about someone like Queen Annie of the Maroons. Think about Angela. Well, no, Angela Davis is an interesting figure because she's in and out of the university at the same time. But think about your Malcolms, your Claudia Joneses, Garvey. Uh, Amy Jakes, Amy, um, uh, Marcus Garvey. These are, those are the ideas, uh, the revolutionary movements on the continent, Kwame Nkrumah, et cetera, et cetera. Very few, if I was going to list my intellectual tradition, very little of it is academic. Very, very, very little. I've got a slide to show you of that. So someone like Malcolm X is important um, because Malcolm, for me, is the most important intellectual of the 20th century, full stop. Certainly, if you're talking about race, if you're talking about blackness, there's definitely nobody better to, to go to than Malcolm. And if you want to, the best place to go would be to understand race relations today, would be 64, Malcolm gives a speech, the ballot or the bullet. I recommend you listen. And you can read it, but that's the other thing about universities. We like, we like written stuff, but actually the oral tradition is really, really, really important. Listen to Malcolm's speech. Don't read it, listen, listen. Because actually the listening to it has a different texture. The texture of it's really important. And Malcolm's really funny as well. So. What was I going on about? Yeah, sorry, Malcolm. There's a whole long, long, long discussion with Malcolm because the concept which underpins this whole talk here is house Negro, field Negro. Right? One of the other reasons I like Malcolm, unapologetic. Right? And nowadays, house Negro is like a... What, that, I was on TV recently, and I don't know if you know Calvin Robinson, who, as you are, yeah, he's religious people, right? So he is um, one of your number. Hey, hey. <laughs> So, yeah, if people who don't know, Calvin Robinson is a commentator, a right-wing uh, black commentator. He's a big afro. He's actually like six foot four. He's massive when you see him. Huge guy. Um, and 
he's, he's, he's essentially on TV to say the things which white people can't say, right? Racism doesn't exist. Black Lives Matter is a joke, etc. We've seen, I've, I've spent far too many, far too much time on TV with people like Calvin Robinson. Um, and he was on TV with me, we were having a debate and somebody tweeted out that he was, he was uh, people call him a house negro. And this got lots of complaints, it was in the newspaper. In the newspaper they even starred out the word negro. Like I didn't realize negro was, 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 a, was a swear. Like, um, and yeah, th these kind of terms like house negro become a, a racial slur. That's not a racial slur. House negro or field negro is intellectual labor, black intellectual labor. The whole point of house negro field negro, and Malcolm articulates this in the speech, message to the grassroots, which is also really, and again, you have to listen, you, you, you can't read that speech, you have to listen to it. You have to listen to it. Listen to the, the intonation, the tone, the pauses, the jokes is actually really funny. It's a very, very, very funny speech as well. Um, and he's, he's, what he's articulating is that he's using this plantation, uh, sorry, the metaphor of the, the slave plantation and saying, well, look, you have the house and the field and the house, the conditions are slightly better, somewhat better. You're still a slave. And this is really important to remember with you. House Negro still a slave. Then they're not saved from slavery. They're just in the house. They don't have the worst labor. They're closer to the house. They get treated slightly better, but they're still slaves. They still get beaten. They still get raped. They still get, they're still property, right? But what he's arguing is that because you're in the house, you have more proximity to the master, slightly better conditions. It's easy to get confused that actually you're doing better, right? That actually you don't need to bring down the house. You don't need to run away because actually the house is it's all right, right? And in the speech, he says, the house Negro says, where can I get a better house than this? Where can I get better clothes than this? There's nothing better than this. This is the lot. And he uses that as a metaphor for a lot of black middle class people in his America. And you could say in Britain today, right? Where we, and, and this is the thing. There is no doubt that all of us professors are in the material position of being house Negroes. I get paid very well, right? I'm all right. I don't really get the, don't get most of the problems of racism. I still get quite a bit of it, but no, you know, <laughs> no, no, the, the, the big problem, we still have problems because we know we're still black, we still get racism. But it's easy for, it will be easy for someone in my position to be confused that it's okay, right? That things aren't that bad, that it's getting better, that we're moving on, etc., etc., etc. Although, actually, as a black professor, it's pretty much impossible for that because you get reminded every day that the racism is a real thing. But <laughs> generally, that's the, that's the basic notion, right? So people can get carried away, believe that um, things, are, things, are, things are progressing, right? Whereas he contrasts that with the field Negro. The field Negro is that person who's in the field, sun up till sun, like getting the whip, the lash. Can't, in that position, there's no way you could possibly think that slavery was anything other than an abomination that needed to be destroyed, right? And so what he's saying is, these are two different positions, and one is authentic and one is inauthentic. And the house Negro is an inauthentic position because it's, it, it, it's not true, right? You're deluded. You're thinking something's okay, right? You're thinking that, <laughs> you're thinking that Britain is going to end racism, right? But does anybody actually think that? Does anybody actually think that racism in Britain will end anytime soon? No, right? I, I, no, nobody thinks this, right? Um, which I'll come back to in a second because that's quite an important point. But um, the House Negro is an inauthentic position because of that. And it's really important we think about authenticity because often when we have this black authenticity discussion, House Negro becomes related to middle class people who talk properly, talk properly, whatever, da, 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 have white friends, white partners. That's not what Malcolm's saying. What he's saying is it's the belief in the system which is oppressing you that makes your uh, mentality inauthentic. This is why I like uh, Robert's house Negro with a field Negro mentality. You can be in the house and have a field Negro mentality. You can understand that the system is, is, is fundamentally racist, needs to be overturned, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's more of a mentality than it is a, a class thing, right? So when we're thinking about the house and bringing down the house, this is why I like Sam Sharp. This is where you get someone like Sam Sharp, right? Sam Sharp is on the plantation, is enslaved. And he's not saying, well, how do I reform slavery? It's how do we make the working conditions on the plantation slightly better, is he? No, we say we need to end it. We need to bond it. We need to get rid of it. We need to bring the thing collapsing down, right? And it's that revolutionary spirit that I don't say we lack completely, but we do kind of lack, right? Because actually one of the things that's changed from Malcolm's time is that in a very real way, so you think about when Malcolm's talking, you don't have racial relations legislation in America. You don't have racial relations legislation here. You don't have, you don't have four black people. You probably don't have four. In the UK, I would doubt you had four black professors full stop, right? Um, it was a very different place where we actually weren't really in the society in any real way. 
Think about the Universal Negro Improvement Association, the largest black organization in history with between two and eight million members across 50 countries. That was 1920s. Because in 1920s, no black person thought that there was anything you could get from America, Caribbean, Britain. Everybody understood that this was a plantation, right? And we have to resist it. What's the big change that's happened over the last 50 years is that we now have some access, right? We have more black professors. We have an overrepresentation of black students at universities, not an overrepresentation at universities like this one, uh, overrepresentation at universities like my university. So it's not perfect, but there's an overrepresentation of black students at university. You have black middle class people. You have, we almost could have had, might still have a black prime minister. You're all celebrating Kemi Badenoch as your prime minister. <laughs> I, I hope not. Um, <laughs> so, so that's what's changed. What's changed now is we kind of, are, we not really, we're still, in a, in a very real way, all of us now are in the house, right? We have some protections under the law. You're, gonna, you're in the welfare state. But living in the UK means that even if you're black, you're still one of the most, the top 80% earners in the entire world. That's the reality, right? So it's opened up enough, so we're kind of all in the house. And so now we're all kind of thinking, can we fix Britain? Can we, get, can, we, can we just try and make it a bit better? Can we just try, you know, try and improve the lot that we have on the plantation rather than thinking, well, actually, this is the plantation and there is no way to reform it. The only thing you can do is to bring it down, right? This is why I write radical. My work is radicalism. Um, but I always stress, it is very difficult to maintain that position as a professor, right? Because the professor is firmly in the house, right? So this whole talk really is by existential crisis about how to do black, <laughs> how, to do, how to do black radical work in the house, like properly, firmly ensconced in the house. And it might be uh, by the end of the talk, I convince myself I need to resign. And there's only three black professors. I don't know. But we'll, <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. All right. So I'm going to start here because this is this is and this ties in actually to to Sam Sharp. And you think about rebellion, right? And very much this is. The field. Does anybody know what this is a picture, picture of? Seen this picture before? This is Boa Kaiman, the, the start of the Haitian Revolution. So this is the ceremony, the start of the Haitian Revolution in, I want to say 1791. Secret, I'm not a historian, so don't ever ask me about dates, because I don't know, I said around 1791, but that's, that's right, right? 1791, start of the Haitian Revolution, and I, st and I start here because, again, thinking about slavery, this is, again, how I learned slavery, so I didn't learn it negatively. I learned it, I learned it positively. In fact, from a black perspective, there is not really much negative at all about slavery. It's about resistance. It's about survival. It's about lots and lots of things like this, right? So Haiti, 1791. Um, this is a, a Voudon ceremony uh, led by Bukman Dotti, who was originally enslaved in Jamaica and then was sold to Haiti. And Cecile Fatiman, who was a practitioner um, of Voudon. Yeah? This is important, actually, it's important thinking about the theolo theological context as well, right? Because actually, one of the arguments as to why Haiti, the only successful slave rebellion rec in recorded history, um, happened is because of roughly about 60% of the enslaved on Haiti were born in Africa, not born in Haiti, right? French slavery was such that they essentially worked you to death. Uh, the average life expectancy was less than 40. Did you just work you to death, brought in new people, etc., 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 like a conveyor belt, which meant that about 60% of the enslaved were from Africa, which meant they also had their indigenous tongues, indigenous skills, indigenous religion, right? Because one of the unfortunate contexts of Christianity is that it was used to pacify black people, right? In the as much in Africa as in the Caribbean, but there was a, a seasoning process, a breaking in process to people taken from Africa, which was to remove languages, tongues, names, religions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and installing a particular version, and I say a particular version, uh, which we'll get to more at the end, a uh, particular version of Christianity which would pacify them, right? So one of the explanations for why Haiti happened is because you've got 60% of people who haven't, who refuse to be broken in and not been broken in. There's also a civil war happening in the region of the Congo, so a lot of people being brought in were sold after being captured and are actually warriors, right? So actually have lots of skills in warfare, right? So this is a very, it's, it's, it seemed to be a very African, very traditional, very connected to the beliefs, right? Now, importantly, <coughs> Haiti is successful by 1804. It's not a coincidence that the British government abolishes the slave trade in 1807. 
And I stress uh, the slave trade. Slavery continues. Anybody know what year slavery continues until in the British Empire? 1838 or 4? 4. Four. Four. So in 1834, in 1834 what happened was um, there was a four year period of apprenticeship because apparently we did not know how to be free. So we needed to learn how to be free for four years. And that apprenticeship was spending 75% of our time uh, working for free on plantations. <laughs> so slavery does not end in the Caribbean until 1838. Anybody tells you 34 is that, that is not true. 1838, right? And in fact, that, that aside, kind of an aside, but uh, Sir, Hilary, Sir Hilary Beckles, Professor Sir Hilary Beckles, mm -hmm. who does a lot of work on reparations in the Caribbean uh, at the University of the West Indies, says that the abolition, uh, the abolition Act was the most racist piece of legislation ever passed by a British government. For two reasons. One, it is apprenticeship. So actually in the act it has apprenticeship. We cannot, we do not know how to be free um, and therefore we have to work 75% of our time for four years. And the other part is the biggest payment ever made by the government to any entity for anything, which is the slave owner compensation or rep we call it reparations, slave owner reparations uh, bill, which was 20 million pounds at the time, off, sorry, 17 million pounds at the time, no, 20 million pounds at the time, often quoted as being 17 billion pounds today. Massive underestimate, it was 5% of GDP. That's 100 billion pounds in today's money. 40% of the government's entire budget that year. It is unprecedented the amount of money they paid to slave owners to abolish slavery. So large, and I'm sure you know this, the loan the government had to take out was so big, when did they actually pay it back? 2015, right? 2015. So everybody in this room, all of you, you might be proud to learn that you paid back slave owner compensation for your taxes. Does this make you feel happy? You abolished slavery. Well done. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My uh, my grandmother was not happy to pl not pleased to know that uh, her and her mother and her <laughs> who had been descended from the enslaved were um, were paying back slave owner compensation. But there you go. Anyway, so most racist piece legislation acts. The reason I bring that up is because 1807 Britain abolishes the slave trade. It was not a moral act. Slavery continues for 31 entire years. The motivation for abolishing the slave trade was twofold. One, it was because, what did I say about French slavery? French slavery needed new Africans. Britain had a different model where they had more people born into slavery. And Britain basically figured we don't need it. We don't need any more. We've got enough. We just breed them. And, it will, and if we can stop the trade, then France was our direct competitor their colonies will go down. It was actually when William Pitt, the, I want to say elder, but it could be junior, no, it's junior. William Pitt the junior learned that in the French, for the French plantations, 50% of the enslaved were on British slave ships. He said, what are we doing? Why are we supporting French slavery? Let's abolish the slave trade and then France can't, French slavery can't happen and we'll be dominant. So it's about economics. And the second reason is they were terrified of Africans. We need to stop bringing Africans in with their religion, African religion, African traditions, African craft, and we need to stop it. We need to stop it, ban it. All right? And so Britain basically calculates that they have enough people, they can keep breeding the enslaved and keep slavery going on for a long time without the slave trade. Not a moral issue. I really want to stress this. And so people tell you that the British, the British Navy went around freeing slaves and destroying slaves. That wasn't because they, want, they were against slavery, because they didn't want competition with, Brit with the British slave, slavery. Simple as that. Right. Um, the other thing is uh, there's a great book by um, Stella Dadzi called A Kick in the Belly, where, again, thinking about agency, the Haitian Revolution is the best example of agency, right, of black people. We just ended the thing. And the first country to abolish slavery was not Britain. It was Haiti in 1804. who abolished it themselves. Um, but in eight, so Britain makes this calculation that we can, we can keep slavery going through, breed, through breeding. What happens after the abolition of the slave trade is that the, uh, the birth rate in the Caribbean plummets, like just literally plummets, overnight plummets. And it only comes back up after slavery has been abolished. And the only explanation for this is that the enslaved women knew what the masters were doing. They knew what Britain was doing. They said, we're not going to breed your next generation of the enslaved. So when slavery does become abolished in um, the 1830s, part of the reason is there isn't enough of the enslaved. There's less people, they don't have enough. And they banned the trade, so they can't get more. So it's starting to become economically... Un uh, so people, say to, people often say, oh, it was economic, it was economic. But the main reason the economics stopped working is because 
they stopped having children. They weren't enough people. They literally were not enough enslaved to carry on. Second, and the other reason slavery was abolished in 1830, well, the Act is 33, happened in 30, it passed in 34, is the Baptist War, 1831, right? Again, these aren't coincidences. You have 20,000 Africans led by Sam Sharp who say, no, we're not doing this, bond is. And they get terrified. And then so they start, and then so slavery becomes abolished, right? In all of these parts, we are active agents in this history. Sam Sharp is a perfect example of that, but there's lots of examples of it. Another reason I bring start with this is the idea of the field, right? The grassroots. Where do we get our knowledge from? This for me is knowledge. Haitian Revolution is knowledge. In fact, if you want to read a, a book about that will tell you so much about problems, negotiations, how you do black politics, C.L.R. James's Black Jacobins is perfect. I mean, perfect. Why does the Haitian Revolution take from 1791 to 1804? Main reason is massive divisions. Right, so at this point, the people who are burning the plantations are the field negroes. Excuse me, it's the grassroots who are saying, no, 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 we are done. We are not having this. Uh, in Haitian society, you had the enslaved, you had a class of what they call mulattoes, which is just a terrible word that we should never use. It's a horrible, horrible, horrible word. Um, who were kind of put, installed in a, in a buffer kind of zone, right? Some privileges, not enslaved, managed a lot of the island. And then you also had free free blacks, right? In fact, Toussaint L'Overture, who you may have heard of, uh, who was really important later on in the Haitian Revolution, was free. Also had slaves as well, right? To tell you something about how the politics worked on the island. Toussaint wasn't involved in, he wasn't involved, right? The, the mix, I'm gonna say mixed race, I say mulatto, it's a terrible word. We're not involved at this point. At this point, it was a field Negro, so we're just gonna start burning. And at some point, they burnt so much and they tipped it so much that everybody had to get involved. And so Black Jacobins is perfect because it really told the, all these discussions and this negotiation, how does everybody get involved? But the mixed race uh, class and the free blacks don't get involved until they have to get involved. Until they just, it's got to the point where you haven't got a choice. You're either with us or you're against us and they, they got with them, all right? Because knowledge is driven from the grassroots. Really, really, really important. The authentic position is the field Negro, but that doesn't mean everybody can't join that position effectively. Does that make sense? Yeah. So Haiti is a really good example of lots of things and a really good starting point. And again, the first country to abolish slavery was Haiti, 1804. Yeah, the other part of that is to say that, so I, we do black studies at the university and, <laughs> and I always say this to people, and even when we have a student, we talk to the students and we the first class, the first, I'm, I'm teaching it now actually to the first years, is the canon, the body of literature for black studies isn't academic. The root of black studies isn't academic at all. It is Haiti, it is resistance, it is lots of things after this, it is Sam Sharp, it is, and this is just a selection of the books that, um, I have a lot of books in my house, but mostly I just stole them from my parents' house <laughs> when I lived, basically. Um, but I was fortunate, and this is, this is why, if I took, what, what is my intellectual tradition and heritage, and why do I not necessarily have the same understanding of what it is to be an intellectual as many academic colleagues, it's because this was my upbringing. It was British black power. I was very, very, very fortunate. Most people don't have this upbringing. Um, and in my house, these were the books. These are the books that were around. These are the books that, that laid about. And one of the things I always stress about British black power is that it, its main contribution was education. You think about the 60s, my mom and dad are growing up, uh, the 60s, 70s. You can't just go on Amazon and I just, I, I've named you like four books. Like you can go and buy them. They'll be in your house tomorrow. Order them right now. You'll get them tomorrow. That was not the case in the 60s. You couldn't get these books, they weren't there. You couldn't get access to them at all, right? So one of the things you had in the Black Power movement was the bookshop movement. It was actually just start, start book, bookshops, import stuff. It was Saturday schools, which I took, I'll skim, I'll skim past. Um, it was um, community organizations and book fairs at community organization meetings. I mean, my dad tells stories of going to like LA and having to go to some guy's house in the hood, like up 10 flights of stairs to get this one book and bring it back into the country. That's what it was like back in the day. It weren't like it is now. We've kind of got totally spoiled with, with the knowledge that we can get. So in the 60s and the 70s, they're building a canon, right? Which includes your Garvey's, it includes uh, the Black Panthers. One of the things I, I've not, well, noticed before, but noticed now, doesn't include many women. It's a very male-centered canon, which is changing, uh, which, is cha which is hope thankfully is now changing. Um, but I always stress that black studies is new in the university, but it's not new at all. 
I do. Right? No, 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 no. Like, I, I, we didn't just come from nowhere. We came from a very, very, very long tradition of black studies, which we've now brought into the university. Right? Um, and it doesn't always work. <laughs> I say that, but there's always, there's always, always, always problems. But, um, but that, that's the, the, the canon, the body of literature, the body of work. It's, it's, it's very African, it's African, it's Caribbean, it's American. It draws on lots and lots and lots of different places. Um, this is just a selection. Uh, I was doing a, I'm going to skip that and come back. I was doing a interview on, not an interview, sorry. We did a radio documentary on the British Black Panthers for Radio 4. that had a lot of archive. And I, I dragged out some of those books. To kind of leaf through, even though it was radio. The radio people are very interesting. They want me to f flick through the books and, and record the sound. And, but, <laughs> and it, I was like, can't we just use any books? He's like, no, 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 it needs to be those books. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Attention to detail, I guess, is, is that thing. <laughs> so, the British Black Panthers. But yeah, if you think about what did the British Black Panthers do, it was largely education, right? It was uh, what we call Saturday schools which were organized in the community. It was events, it was protest, it was speakers, right? That's one of the really underrated things um, historically in the UK. Because the UK is the center of empire, it means that we have had pretty much everybody has come through Britain at some, at some point, right? So one of the things that sparks the British Black Panthers is um, Stokely, Stokely, yeah, let me go back to Stokely. Stokely Carmichael, Kwame Touré comes in a year in the 70s, which I believe is 72, but I wouldn't, no, 68, actually, no, no, 68. It's coming in 68. Um, and speaks and really inspires lots of people, right? Malcolm came, Martin Luther King came, everybody came from the States, uh, but also from African countries as well. In fact, one of the stories my dad tells, actually, my dad left community organization late 70s, and the reason he gives is that he was sharing a platform with Hernan Chitepo, who was a, revolution leader, a revolutionary leader in Zimbabwe, and they were talking and they were sharing this platform, and then the next week, Chitepo was assassinated, um, and he was like, I'm not really serious. <laughs> this, this guy's serious. Like he's get, he's just, I'm just got doing my life in Answorth. And he was like, actually, I need, to, I need to, maybe I need to rethink and do. And he became a lawyer, and and did um, criminal criminal defense work. Uh, but that was the, at the time. This is the kind of stuff we're here. These these events. These it was so it's something that's very difficult to appreciate now, right? Because we have so much access to info, etc. Uh, so Stokely speaks. I highlight that book in particular because in my own personal journey, this book was very 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 important. Um, I mostly picked it up because he looks ridiculous. <laughs> I was like, this book's going to be funny, let me read it. And I read it, completely changed. Honestly, I was not expecting it at all. Don't judge a book by its cover, uh, I think is the way to put it. Really, really, and, and again, I haven't read it for a long time, so I'm not going to say this is the best book ever, but for my 16-year-old self reading this, completely transformed the way I thought about things, right? and then turned me on to the rest of the pile of books, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? But, this is why this kind of educational journey is really, really important because you, know, you don't get this education in school, you won't get this education in the media, but black communities historically have been very good at having, making sure that we get this education elsewhere, somewhere, right? And that is something we need, definitely, definitely, definitely need to continue, otherwise we will be lost, believe me. So yes, Totally Speaks is the one I always recommend. Uh, the Panthers, um, Saturday Schools, this is, this is a book I wrote about the black supplementary school movement, which if you don't know, is a 50 year tradition of black communities basically saying, look, racism's terrible, so we're gonna organize our own schools. We'll just teach ourselves, right? Self-help. Uh, Self-help is a whole movement in the UK um, from schools, from housing, um, employment agencies, legal defense, self-help, right? The, the, and this is something, again, it's something we really, I would say have lost as a community is the idea that why are you relying on the state for anything? We know the state is racist, and we should definitely know the state is racist now. And if you don't know now, then you're never going to know, right? Um, so we have to do our own thing, right? Build our own stuff. And this is what Saturday schools do. They say, look, the schools won't teach, so we'll teach. And Saturday schools are different because it's not just um, most, so all ethnic minority groups have some kind of supplementary education, but it's usually about culture or religion or language, things you wouldn't expect to be taught in the schools. Saturday schools were for, for primarily about maths and English because the kids are coming out unable to read. That's how bad it was in the 60s, right? So they always had black history, well, not always. Lots of them actually don't have any black studies to them at all. Actually, yeah. just about maths and English. Uh, but then you also have this, this movement that says, look, we need maths, I mean, sorry, we need black studies, we need, to, we need to think, we need to engage differently, we need to create a different canon, different curriculum. Uh, like I said, 50-year history. But a very under, 
under, un, under understood, under misunderstood, I don't know, lack of understanding around his history. So I wanted to say, I always say I'm not a historian, but if you do this work, you have to be a historian. So actually, when I did Saturday schools, I wasn't writing it from history perspective at all. But then when I went to write the book, I was like, well, there's no book about Saturday schools. So I had to write the book, right? This is kind of what happened. Um, one of the projects we're trying to get money for at the minute is a oral history of like 200 black power activists in the 60s and 70s. Because it's not, I mean, it's, it's, there's some writing about it, but it's bad. Like, I'll be honest with you, it's bad. Really, really poorly understood. Very lack of documentation. And if we don't interview the people soon, that, that knowledge just dies, literally disappears, right? So you kind of have to become a historian. You don't have a choice because the history is just not there, right? Because we're not in the spaces, not in the academy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, this is a picture of, actually, anybody guess where this is? Anybody know where this is, seen this picture? This is Hansworth Park. African Liberation Day. African Liberation Day, 1977. What I was saying about those alternative spaces, yeah, by Van Lee Burke, who's a historian of black people generally, but Birmingham in particular, and Hansworth really specifically. Um, first African Liberation Day in Birmingham, the third in the UK. And again, this is this idea that there, was, there were these spaces of education. They still have Af African Liberation Day every, every year. Um, May Bank Holiday, at the end of May Bank Holiday, there will be an African Liberation Day in Birmingham. And it is this, this space where you can learn different things understand different things, bring together the community in a very different way, right? That's why I say black studies is not new. It's not new at all. This is, this is what I grew up in. This is, this is the only tradition that I know, right? So when Robert's saying like there's, there's um, academics who are like this, like this, like this, I just don't have that tradition. So for me, it's just, it's just like logic. I don't know how to be anywhere. How would you be any other way, right? Because this is the tradition that we came up in. A tradition that's de rooted in the grassroots, rooted in community, that can't exist without community, right? Literally can't exist. Um, with that community. And I use this as an example for something we did ages ago in, um, in, so we have the Harambee organization. We still have the Harambee organization of Black Unity in Birmingham. We used to have the Harriet Tubman Development Center, which, which was the Harriet Tubman Bookshop uh, on Grove Lane, which anybody from Birmingham would probably have been to if you're definitely young, my age or older, you certainly would know the Harriet Tubman Bookshop. And one of those spaces where we brought in different books, different education, etc. I was I was volunteered to work there as a young person a number of times by my by my parents. Um, yeah. And so in 2012, we were trying to save the building. We couldn't. Long story. Lots of financial problems with the organisation. We couldn't save that particular building. But we still do have uh, the Linwood Road, which is the Marcus used to be the Marcus Garvey Nursery, is now the Marcus Garvey Centre. And also there is Harambee House, which is a hostel started out as a hostel for, for black people. So those two buildings still exist, right? Just to give you an example of the kind of self-help initiative that people started. Like, the, the state won't do it, we'll do it ourselves, right? Um, and so one of the things we started to do when we started to do the, um, let's try and engage Harambee again, we said, let's do community talks, discussions, events. Let's just go out and talk to people, right? Like, that's what we should do, because this is where you get the best kind of knowledge. And the reason I use this particular example is because the major problem with universities, if you can make it, just break it down simply, is that they are elite bubbles where you only have ever talk to anybody else in the bubble. That's basically the problem. And the people, most of the people in the bubble are white and elite. So, <laughs> I mean, Robert mentioned Gilroy, so I feel like I can mention Gilroy here. But like, if, if you don't know who Paul Gilroy is, Paul Gilroy is probably the most esteemed black intellectual in the UK, I think it's fair to say, probably. Esteemed by who is a good question, but esteemed, <laughs> certainly. But esteemed within the bubble, right? And Gilroy talks and writes in a particular way that I don't understand half the time, to be, to be, to be quite honest. Um, but that only works because who is Gilroy talking? Who's his audience? It's not the community, it's not the grassroots at all. It's the people within the bubble. And that's what keeps university separate, elite. Think about, I mean, it's good to see people from a community in the university, because think about how many times you ever really go into a university if you don't work there or now you're not paying to be there. These are not spaces you, now they're not spaces you can go into because you have to swipe in, etc. This is the problem with the university. It's elite, it's separate. It's one of the reasons why if I don't, I, if I don't stay an academic, it would probably be that reason, right? In order to become professor, I had to write things which I would never now write. <laughs> like now I'm a professor, I don't care, right? I don't have to worry about promotions. So I don't have to worry about journal articles, which literally sap the life out of you if anybody has to write a journal article. <laughs> My God, I... <laughs> It's like, so I was, we took, and so in, in universities we have something now, um, open access. So you know, like you actually can't read a lot of the journal articles because you have to pay. So there's a paywall, and so there's a big push to get uh, open access so people can read them. I always say it's pointless. 
The problem isn't that people can't read them. The problem is, even if you could read it, I guarantee you wouldn't want to read it anyway. <laughs> no, no, I mean, I'm just being honest. Like, I was, I, and I tried this with my students the other day. I, I was a member of the British Sociological Association, and they always send you their journal, Sociology. You have hundreds of these journals. I swear I've never read anything in them, because every time I leave through, I just turn off completely. And I even gave, I tried giving them away to the students. They looked, have one, have one, and they didn't want them. I'm not, joking, I'm not joking. I even left them in the room for a week. They were all still there because nobody else wanted them either. <laughs> right? this, the, that's the problem that we we have that we actually have a, a way of talking, thinking, writing, expressing our views, which is deeply elitist, separate in the bubble, and it only makes sense within the bubble. So even Paul Giro, do people know who Paul Giro is? Yeah. The academics of you, the non-academics of you, know who Paul Giro is? Yeah, some people. Okay, Giro is maybe has some crossover appeal, certainly. But you'll find like a lot of the people who think of, who we think are, are are like famous, nobody knows who they are, right? Because within the bubble it makes sense. Outside the bubble, it doesn't make any sense at all, right? This is actually why the idea of the public intellectual. I, I don't know. I don't, it's a really, for me. It's a really problematic idea. All intellectual work should be public. By its very definition of being an intellectual, you should have to talk and engage with the public. And if you don't, then what are we doing, right? That's why I don't. That's why for me it's not. A thing like it just make. Why would I not go and talk to the public? It's a really strange thing to to do, right? Um, and actually doing it, and the, the reason I I, I I go on on about this is because doing it actually makes your work better, right? If I was going to critique Paul Giro's work on blackness, he writes quite a lot about blackness. It's bad because he just talks to the bubble. You can't understand blackness within this place. You can't forget it. Stop. You can, if you, if your only reference is within university, you're going to misunderstand blackness. You have to be outside. You have to be talking, engaging, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's that that, ma that makes the work make sense, right? So this talk is the talk I gave 2012, black is a country. I still say black is a country. My son looks at me and says, don't be ridiculous. Black can't be a country. There's no passport. There's no, there's no border. Um, and I had this experience in, we had, so we have this, this is uh, in Hansworth, Harry Thorne bookshop. Um, about 50 people all packed into the building talking about black is, and I'm, I'm saying black is a country. This uh, Zimbabwean guy comes in, he's mad, 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 mad. He's like, you can't say black is a country. That's racist. There's so many different countries. And I was like, yeah, okay, let's, 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 let's reason it out. Let's talk. I'm not joking, but end of the talk, he interrupted me to say black is a country. <laughs> <laughs> so then I knew, I was like, yeah, black is, it makes sense, right? That works. That's the kind of affirmation. Right? Not the peer review. I don't care about peer review. That, FMA, that one story is a story I tell forever. That's way more important than did I get a peer review journal article with black is a country, which I did, actually, by the way. Don't know how, <laughs> but I managed to get a peer reviewed article. But it's actually that, that discussion, right? And actually, in the process of that discussion, it, it changed some of the things I was thinking about. It, and I, so back to black is the book, which this, this is in. And it's an academic text in some ways. Like, it's not academic, academic, but it's, it is academic, academic. What does that even mean? It's not boring, that's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> right. But it's, it's essentially a theory book about black radicalism and black politics, but I couldn't have done it without this. I couldn't have done it without 10 years of actually doing the work. It wouldn't have made any sense. It wouldn't have existed. And it, within the book, there's loads of stories about those kind of stories in the book, right? And that's, that's how we have to think about our work. It has to be connected to the grassroots. Even though, look, like I said, very firmly in the house Negro position, you have to make an effort then to go and make sure you're engaging outside. Because otherwise you get lost, like really lost. Um, obviously, Malcolm, I, I just wanted a picture of Malcolm. Um, <laughs> but Malcolm with Claudia Jones. Because uh, Claudia Jones massively under, uh, under, under thought about, underappreciated. And yeah, that's a good one. Underappreciated figure who um, was born in Trinidad, moved to America with a family, was a communist in America, became very high up in the Communist Party, and then was deported. Uh, in the McCarthy trials, but she wasn't deported to Trinidad. What do you think? Hmm? She, yeah, even what they did not want her in the Caribbean, because in the Caribbean at the time, in Trinidad in particular, there was massive unrest. So uh, we can't send Claudia Jones to Trinidad, she'll, she'll be a problem. So they sent her to the UK. Why, is it, why Britain? Oh, that's a bit strange. Why are they sending her to Britain? Why do you think? Why Britain? But why Britain legally? How could they legally send her to Britain? Yeah, Trinidad was not a country. People forget, Trinidad weren't a country in 1955. Trinidad was part of the British Empire. Her nationality was British, so they could deport her to Britain. Yeah. 
So this is the thing about Britain. I mean, I can give you a whole talk about this, I won't. But when you think about Britain problematically, Britain is empire, Britain is not nation state. This is why Claudia Jones ends up here. And the logic is she'll be safe, we'll be safe in Britain. But no, obviously she carries on. She carries on organizing, organizes anti-immigration, um, uh, anti-immigration legislation comp campaigns, organizes the first, this is the first black British newspaper, the West Indian Gazette. Um, organizes the things that lead to the Notting Hill Carnival after the 1958 Notting Hill race riot. A race riot, the actual definition is when white people get mad about black people and they start burning things. That's a race riot. And the UK has had a number of them, including 58. And so after that, Claudia Jones is one of the group that organizes uh, cultural events to, she says, to wash the taste of our ma out of our mouths of the, of the event, but also to raise money for the legal fees, defense of the black people who get caught up by the police after the riot. And that becomes a Notting Hill Carnival. Right? So, Notting, so Claudia Jones becomes a really, really, really important figure um, in, the U, in, the, in the UK. Has a book, Beyond Containment, which is a um, collection of her writings, which I strongly recommend. Again, very underappreciated under academic. I, I've already talked about Malcolm, so I'm gonna skip Malcolm. Um, sorry, I've been just talking. How long do I have left? Because I've got one forever, so. <laughs> Five minutes? 15 minutes, oh, okay, perfect, yeah, yeah, all right, okay, so, um, thinking about it, because I want to switch, I want to really, really, really get to this idea of all of that knowledge, ideas, politics, movements, how can you do that within this terrible space, all right, and I say terrible because it's terrible, that's the professor, it's terrible, all right, so, how can you do it within this space, so black studies in the US is very similar to here, in the sense that the knowledge of black studies is outside of the University, what gets black studies in America is the black power movement. It's not a coincidence, it's 60s. It's 69 is the first black studies department, San Francisco State. Uh, it's, it's very much black power. Black Panthers are involved here. Without the, poli without the outside external politics, there is no black studies in the United States. It does, simply does not exist. So it is that same thing of how do we bring in this knowledge into the university um, and transform what the university does. And Nathaniel Hare, who's one of the founders of Black Studies talks about the community component being the most important component. And I, I would stress that is the most important component because it is the thing which separates the ivory tower elite separateness, but Black Studies is about, no, it's about organically the connection to the community, right? Has to be there. And that's why I always stress Black Studies is not African Studies, not Caribbean Studies, it's not even African American Studies. Because you can do all of those things without the community component. And actually most of those things, even African American Studies, are done without the community component. It's a community component that makes black studies different because it means we're always organically connected, we're always rooted in. So in the degree, for example, students have to do a placement, that's the language of the university, in a community, with a, either with a community organization or doing stuff, in the, doing stuff with the community, right? They have to apply black studies. They have to do a black studies project where they can prove that the project itself wasn't just a research thing for their benefit, actually had a benefit to the community as well. Right? So that as a method, we're saying, look, that's really, really, really essential uh, to black studies. This is a picture from Cornell University um, in 60, I want to say 69 as well, actually. I think it was 69 too, where they, they basically occupied the Willard Strait Hall, which was a, a, like a, a student center in the university. And they didn't go in armed. They just, they just went in unarmed, but they had lots of threats from the Ku Klux Klan, etc. So they armed themselves in the building afterwards. And they get, this is the picture as they negotiate as they walk out, right? They call this the battle for black studies. In America, it really was a bat, like an actual battle where, where there was a physical threat to people's lives. In the UK, not at all. Like, it hasn't been like that at all. Far easier than you would think. We didn't, have to, we didn't have to arm ourselves. But it does tell you how dangerous these ideas can be, right? So this, you are trying to do something which kind, that doesn't kind of, which really fundamentally goes against the principles of the place itself, right? Uh, in the UK, context slightly different. So you have decolonize, uh, why is my curriculum white, um, pushing this agenda from the ground, from the student level. And then we have, you know, black studies came in on that wave in some, in some senses as well. But again, the, the big difference, the, not difference, the reason why it took longer in the UK rather than America is largely demographic. So there's less black people here. Um, whereas in America, there's, there's always been lots of black people in America. Uh, but also, widening participation happens later. All right, it's only like 92, uh, I mean, even in like places like Oxford, this place like here, it's only been really, kind of really recently that you've had critical masses of black students, and what they do, they come into the place and say, well, what on earth is this? 
<laughs> That's what happens, right? We say, what is this? We need to change. It needs fundamental overhaul, reform, et cetera, et cetera, which is why that delay has happened. Because in the UK, this, this, the whole wine and participation thing happened later. Um, but it's the same kind of context, right? There's some people come into the union and say there's something wrong with it, right? One of those things is wrong, and I did mention this earlier in the, um, the lack of black, black women uh, in the book list, and this is a problem historically for, for many things, but there has been a big push in terms of black studies. And if you think about black studies now, the biggest part of it is black feminism. Yeah, no, like it's lots and lots of work, lots of stuff being produced. Um, people like Keisha, in the States, people like Keisha Blaine, who's written lots of work about black women in like the Garvey movement, in the civil rights movement, etc. Um, in the UK, you have people like Stella Dadzi. Um, there's, there's lots of work on this, and it's, it's, it is a credit to where we're trying to go, right? Because we need to not, decolonize doesn't just mean black people, it means adding in the things which are missing, and uh, women's voice, feminist voices, queer voices, every missing, right? So those things are trying to be done, right? So there's some good developments which are certainly happening, and black feminism is one of the key strands uh, in our course as well. I'm stripping through because I wanted to get to this bit, because um, it ties us back into Sam Sharp as well. So we think about um, <laughs> black studies, everything we try to do, we try to bring in this community and certain knowledge, etc., etc., etc. So I got my professor in. Wait, what year was it? I don't remember now. 2018. Yeah, 2018. Um, and this is a letter that I got from the, the com Committee for the Conferment of Academic Titles. Right? So I tweet this out when I got it. And the students are all, when I get into class the next day, students are all celebrating, clapping. Da, 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 da. Right? But it's, 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 it's black studies, right? So it's critical. And honestly, if you come to black studies, you just spend the first, <laughs> you spend the first several weeks going, why on earth am I doing this course? Because right? it's very, very critical. Right? And so I'm saying that, so we actually end up having a three hour conversation about why you shouldn't be happy that I got made professor of black studies. <laughs> right? I was like, yeah, let's do a whole class. This whole, this one slide was a whole class of three hours. Like, what, what, what are we doing? Why, why do you think I was like, hold on a second. Who signed? So the people that signed my letter are Professor Philip Plowden, who's copied to Professor Keith Horton, who's our faculty lead, and um, Mark O'Dwyer, Director of Human Resources. What do you think they were having in common? Yeah, it's three white men, right? Yeah. Which isn't the end of the world, you know, three white men. It does tell you something about the power structure of the university. In terms of the Committee for the Conferment of Academic Titles, how many black studies experts do you think they had on that, on that committee? Not how many black people didn't have on that committee? <laughs> there was also zero, right? So think about it. I had to submit uh, an application. If you don't know how professors work, you submit an application. Yeah. I've done all these wonderful things. I should be professor. But the people that decided, none of them knew anything about black studies. Not one of them knew anything. So how is this a legitimate title? It's not, right? Really, it's not. Like, it's not like, what I said to the students, it's good for me. I get paid more, it's great. But actually, we actually look at what this is, it's terrible. This is nonsense. This is, this is totally and utterly inauthentic. This is house stuff, right? And actually, worse than that, think about the things I had to do to become professor. It wasn't the public intellectual stuff. I never got it. It wasn't the community stuff. It wasn't the activism stuff. It wasn't any of that. It wasn't the writing for... Like I spent lots of time writing like really non-public articles for, I mean, public, public articles, non-academic stuff. It wasn't any of that. It was, I've produced this many peer-reviewed articles in this thing. I've got this much money from these people. I've done this many talks within the bubble. What I call the white stuff, right? That's how I got promoted, from this, in this, to this panel of people who know nothing about Blair Studies. So like, that's why you very rarely hear me say professor this, professor that. Because for me, professor is an illegitimate title. It just gets me more money. Nice, thank you, I appreciate it. <laughs> but actually, the, the, the bet, my favorite response to this was lots of people said, oh, we thought you already were a professor of black studies. I was like, oh, yeah, thanks, I like that. I'll take that, I'll take that as, 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 as a credential. But actually, this was, this was interesting. Now, more importantly than that, though, when you get main professor, your life changes a little bit, financially, certainly, but also in the terms of invitations that you get change. So I went to the University of Birmingham <laughs> had a very public fallout with the University of Birmingham because when we were there, they closed down our sociology department and fired all the black members of staff. Like, I'm not joking, it happened in 2011. So we had a big public Save Our Sociology campaign on local TV. They hated me when I left that university. Honestly, like, hated me. In fact, I went for a job somewhere the other day, and not the other day, it was a while ago, and the, the, the head head, the dean, was <laughs> the, the dean at the time when we were in Birmingham. And <laughs> I got, I got, there was a two-part interview. One was the department, etc. I got all the way, like, yeah, we love you, we love you, we love you. I, he wouldn't even meet me as the second part of the interview. All of a sudden, I wasn't in the process anymore. That's how much they don't, they don't like me that place, right? So 
But after I got made professor, I got an invitation from uh, the vice chancellor of the University of Birmingham, who I know knows me, who I know doesn't like me. We publicly fell out, right? So I get this invitation for dinner at his house. I'm like, wow. <laughs> So honestly, I did. I really thought about is this a place to go? I was quite worried. I had very much these kind of vibes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not joking. <laughs> it took me a long time. To, I had to I literally spoke, spoke to my wife for about three hours. Am I going to go? Should I go? Should I send the invitation? I was terrified, right? You don't know these people. I, I don't know, right? <laughs> so, Anyway, I'm, I'm, half, I'm half joking, but not really. Um, but the worst part of this story isn't that, actually. I actually went. Obviously, I went. I was like, why not? See see how it is. Go along. Oh, you know, I went Went there. We sat around. There was actually another black um, academic from another university. It was Black History Month, after all. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but the worst, part of this, the worst part of this is it was all right, you know. It was fine. We sat there. We chatted. Other than the servings of food, which are really small, other than that, I know like, we had like six, six, six courses and I still had to go to KFC afterwards. Like, <laughs> 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 That's serious actually, dude. It's hungry. Hungry afterwards, right? Other than that, it was fine. Like, uh, totally fine. So I had a perfectly fine evening, uh, left all the jokes, left, was fine. And that told me that actually this process had already happened 10 years before this. A, I wouldn't have got the invitation. B, if I had the invitation, there's no chance I would have gone or would have gone with like paint and thrown it all over the place. Um, <laughs> if I had gone, I would have hated it every second of it and got thrown out. So something's obviously changed in 10 years for me to sit there laughing at all the jokes, etc. cetera, right? Something's changed, right? I have already changed. That's what being in the house does to you. It changes you. And this is why I talk about doing the white stuff because I had to spend a lot of time doing that stuff. And it's not like a little thing. It's not easy things to do. It takes long to do it. So I've already been changed by the process of being in the house, and this is the danger, right? This is why I always try to be negative about everything, so you kind of get some perspective, right? <laughs> let's, 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 let's rethink. Um, so yeah, the, the, it's already happened, right? We, and the problem, and I've seen it in lots of colleagues in the way that you have to adapt to fit. And the university is not separate to not like you could say the same thing about church. Definitely, I mean, definitely say the same thing about church or any other institution, right? You become people bec tend to become the institution. You don't tend to change the institution as much as you like to think. Right? And actually, why for Black Studies, I always say we're not trying to colonize, deco we're not trying to decolonize the university, we're trying to colonize the university. Right? You can't decolonize this thing, but you can use the, the, some of the influence from it. And this is where I get to Sam Sharp. Because right? this, is, to me, is the metaphor. The only way I can think about being a Black Studies professor with radical ideas in the uni, and this is, professor is essentially like slave preacher. Right? Which sounds negative, believe me, it's going to get positive towards the yeah. So what was the role of the slave preacher? It was to teach a very passive version of Christianity which would make people feel enslaved, keep them enslaved, keep them happy, singing, dancing, teach them that. That's, that was the purpose of Christianity for the slave master, that was the purpose of the slave preacher uh, for the master as well. Right? And many people did that, that's what they did. They went around, they talked, they did it, they got slightly better rewards, that house negro mentality, and they just carried on. That was, that was what they did. But... Is it a coincidence? Sam Sharp, what was he? Slave preacher. Right? Nat Turner, slave preacher. Denmark, Denmark, Denmark Vesey, slave preacher. Right? Actually, if you actually look at lots of the rebellions on plantations, slave preachers. And the reason is because, because they were slave preachers, they had particular advantages that other people didn't have. So, for example, you could not gather in these numbers in any other circumstance than slave preaching. Right? They would let the congregations gather, lots of people meet together. You, there were, you couldn't read. You were banned from reading other than reading the Bible and the slave could read the Bible, right? Now they read the Bible and read something different. And they said, no, we're liberation theology. We should be free. They didn't take the standard thing they were told to do. They transformed it. Slave preacher was also the only person who could travel around the plantations freely to go to minister, right? So that's why the slave preacher often leads the rebellion. Now, most of the time, 90% of slave preachers don't do that, right? They just, just do what they're meant to do. But it's a, you're in a position where you have the privileges in order to ferment revolution and that's Sam Sharp, right? So this is the only metaphor I can use. For, for, this, is the, this is the way I can justify the professor because this is what the black studies professor should do, right? Use that position, use those advantages. There is no other job that I could do and get away with <laughs> for them, the things that I do, time-wise, money-wise, resources-wise. I just said that the project we're trying to do to get uh, the oral histories of black, of, um, black activists 
in that project, there's lots of money for the organization to redo the building, to make sure it works. So this is, we're in a position where we have so many, we have, I have more access to resources in my position than most people do, right? And so it's incumbent upon me to then use that to bring down the house. That's where it, that, that's the idea of the of the slave of the slave master. Unfortunately, if you do this work too much, you can often become the problem, right? Like I've been like I won't say the university because it's recorded, um, but I went to <laughs> I went to a university in America with a re reputation for being radical, and phew, there's a long story. But I'm going to cut this short because I know time's running. But I went to this university and I'm sitting there. There's a me, the head of the department, and a younger academic from somewhere else, and the, the head of the department says, last year, we, have, we forgot that we had a, a, a grant of $675,000. Forgot. They have so much money, they forgot they had a grant. I've never, I've never even, don't even know what that means. And with this, not even got, for context purposes in the UK, forget about it. Forgot. He goes to all the, the departments and says, have $75,000, spend it on what you like. Has to be research-wise. Half of them can't even think of anything to spend it on. Right? That's how comfortable they become. Right? Worst part of the story, the young academic, first thing he says is, oh, that's crazy. I would have bought some furniture for my office. <laughs> I'm like, what? Honestly, I didn't know what to say. I was a moment where I said, well, I don't know what to say. I left the place depressed. Like, that's the place where actually, and that's why I always say African-American studies is not the model that we're looking for. Because all the resources, all the money, all the things, you could do anything you want. Imagine having that many resources, and that's what you do. You, you buy furniture for your office? I mean, why? So, but it also says we have, can have access to those resources. Imagine those resources with a field Negro mentality. Imagine what the modern day Sam Sharp would do with that, right? That's why this is a positive thing, right? We are in these places. We are here. It's, they have prestige. There is, and also stress, there is no other job that's better. You're not like off the plantation anywhere, even in community work. You know how, how tired you are to keep government agenda, community funding, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There is no other job that gives you the freedom to do the things that we have. The problem is we don't really do, we don't tend to use it in the way that we should be using it, right? But Sam Sharp's a perfect model. So use that position to subvert the, the house, to subvert the institution. That's why I say we're not trying to decolonize the university, we are colonizing the university, drawing out those resources so we can fundamentally bring down the house eventually, right? And that's, that's why I think the spirit of Sam Sharp is so important. And I'll stop there. <laughs> <laughs> have about, I think, 20 minutes or so for questions, and if you're online, please type your question in the chat, and those of you in the room, can put your hand up and we can get a mic to you. Um, I'm, well, I want to start off really by asking, yeah. if, if, if hmm? you don't mind, yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, a question, I mean, I, I think it's important, right, that you remind us where that the intellectual space in terms of theorization about the black condition doesn't happen in the space of the university. Mm -hmm. um, and you uh, referred us to a number of texts that you use, you know, that were, that were really um, influential in terms of helping your intellectual development. But, I mean, I think if we have to think about the community, though, then we have to think of other spaces apart from the text mm -hmm. where that intellectual education takes place. And I think that um, you know, it links up with Sham Sharp. So for me, I would say um, Bob Marley was a really, Bob Marley's lyrics was yeah. really important for me as a, you know, as a point, as a basis for um, consensitization. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what you, you know, and, and here, perhaps, you know, the pulpit is, a, is yeah. another space, you know? So I don't know what you think about these other spaces mm -hmm. and how we might, um, you know, as, as academics, we might work within these spaces to, um, you know, to, to develop what we would call black studies. Yeah, definitely. I mean, so in my inaugural lecture, there is a, um, the first slide is actually a dead prez. I don't know if anybody, you show your age if you know who dead prez are. Uh, but it's a hip hop group from the States. They have this great album, Let's Get Free. And as a young person, the books were important, but that was probably more important than anything, 
right? Asata Shakur, my daughter's named Asata, who was uh, a black, uh, part of the Black Liberation Army, who was escaped from prison, basically. She was, she was put in prison uh, for killing a police officer, which she couldn't have done. She escaped from prison, is now in Cuba. I only heard about her from a song uh, by Common called A Song for Asata. So yeah, I can give you lots of references like, in terms of music. Mm -hmm. And for my age, it's kind of hip hop and then reggae for, and, um, and reggae for my age too, but you know, like, yeah, those kind of things are really, really, really important. And, I, and we use them as well. We use them a lot in class. We, you, we draw on them. I talk about them all the time. Because, um, yeah, it is really important. Our intellectual heritage, the black arts movement, for instance, mm -hmm. really is in those kind of spaces. And we should, we should see that. As, and Bob Marley is, a, is an intellectual too, right? Um, it's really important to see that, I think. OK. Oh, even before I could hand, there's one up there. So let's um, take some questions from the audience. Thank you for your talk. I just wondered, um, could you say whether Malcolm X was a field Negro or a house Negro? And was Martin Luther King a field Negro or a house Negro? <laughs> uh, well, certainly, according to Malcolm, um, Malcolm was a field Negro. And Malcolm, and Malcolm, and this is, you know, Malcolm very much, you know, grow, his, his parents are in the Garvey movement. His dad is killed because of that. He, you know, he, 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 he grows up in poverty, right? He comes from the hood, he, he ends up in jail. So that is kind of that kind of that classic, like, field Negro outside the system, right? But also importantly, I'd say intellectually, because his parents are in the Gavi movement. Like, there is a particular way that he's grown up and is connected. Mm -hmm. um, and his criticism is of, Ma of Martin Luther King is that mine doesn't have that experience, right? Martin is, he's not, again, he's not rich in any, in any shape, but he has a different perspective and certainly represents the house Negro. And actually, Ma and... But more than that, in fact, Malcolm then takes that criticism further because House Negro isn't really a criticism. Mm -hmm. It's actually just the recognition of your privilege and understanding how that privilege might make you not really see this. It's not, Malcolm said, look, House Negro, Field Negro, we're all in this together. We're all enslaved. We need to come together. It's, this, is, this isn't, it's not, it often, sounds like, it often sounds like a criticism, but it's really, it's really not in that sense. But Malcolm then has a different concept, which is the Uncle Tom. And the Uncle Tom is different because Uncle Tom is someone who is used by black people, by, sorry, by the, by the white power structure to lead black people astray. And actually what he says about Martin Luther King is he's an Uncle Tom, right? And actually that passive civil rights, turn the other cheek, is actually the worst thing we could do, integrating us into this racist system. So Malcolm's criticism of Martin is, far, is worse than Harris Negro. He's actually saying he's actually actively doing something against black people, which is why I always say Malcolm is not a civil rights leader. Malcolm was the most critical person of civil rights you will ever find in the history of people. Because he actually believed that civil rights was something that was worse, it's actually worse than racism, it's in the, the, the kind of racism of the South, because it, we think we've made progress when we haven't made any progress at all. Right? William. Yeah, it's, um, the other, the number five black professor in the room is here, <laughs> actually, he was mentioned earlier, William. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, not, not quite professor yet, but, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, thank you, Katie, yeah, for the Almost. powerful reminder, really, as to what, why we're engaged in this academic enterprise. And I, and I suppose, so my question is, in, the, in that sense, around critical mass. Do you think, what do you think of then the idea of a black university? Does that lead us more towards the kinds of community engagement and critical mass, or is it leading us to having a lot of elite, <laughs> more elite people in elite <laughs> spaces? Uh, it depends, but historically, it's the, it's the latter, right? So actually, the, the article, The Battle for Black Studies by Hare, is a whole criticism of historically black colleges and universities. Mm -hmm. uh, because actually, if you look at historically, the hate speech used are actually creations largely of racism, segregation, often by white benefactors. They're often the most conservative places. They're way more conservative than the, than the white institutions. In fact, most HBCUs don't do black studies. I would never consider doing black studies because it goes against the kind of ethos. We actually took the students to Xavier, Xavier College of Louisiana, which is the, a very small HBCU, but trains more black doctors than any other university, which tells you about racism in, in American universities. Um, and I went there, I did a talk about black studies, and we had to change rooms because so many students wanted to come, it's packed. And I'm like, why on earth is it packed? Like, surely this is what you get all the time. And they all said, this is the first black thing we've had 
at all. I'm like, what? That makes, that makes no sense. Like, what are you talking about? Because uh, aesthetically, it looks black, right? But actually, 70% of the faculty are white, interestingly. And actually, the courses they do are just traditional, very, very conservative. And again, think about the Caribbean, because the Caribbean is like the American South. Mm. One place I'm sure I'll never get invited to go and talk is the University of the West Indies. I mean, my home, my home, my home place, right? But it's so conservative. I can't, they're never going to have me there. Because the problem is that just because you've got black people, it doesn't necessarily mean it's black. And a university is a university. And if you just build universities on the same principles, we actually tend to do, we actually, when we do, we tend to do it worse. It tends to be more colonial, it tends to be more conservative. Um, and yeah, so if we could have a black university, which was different, then certainly. But I, I, I strongly doubt that would be what would happen, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, this is Sorry. Hi, good evening. Thanks so much for your talk. Um, I think the question that I wanted to ask is, you, you talk a lot about community and this idea also of, um, I guess, black solidarity and this concept of the black nation. And I wanted to ask how you reconcile that with, or maybe I should ask whether the romanticization of community can sometimes mask and hide um, hurtful actions done in the name of black liberation. So looking at Marcus Garvey, for example, his imperial and colonial attitudes towards people on the African continent, for example, in a number of his speeches. And then also, for example, like Du Bois's actions in Liberia um, that you know very much um, reflect American imperial ideals. And yeah, just some commentary on that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think it's important that, like, community in this sense, in the university sense, is like, well, we just say everybody in community, but actually community in the, in the black studies sense means engaging with the community, and it's a very diverse space, and believe me, there's some really bad ideas in community. I'm not suggesting that community, everybody in the community has all the great ideas. Believe, I mean, I could give you some terrible examples of, <laughs> yeah, I won't do it. Anyway, but, <laughs> but, but, and so we, what we have to do is engage that and to discuss that. So, for instance, the boys, once we understand from a radical perspective, Du Bois is not, Du Bois is more university than community. Du Bois' ideas are deeply problematic. Mm -hmm. Garvey is a good example too, actually, where there's many problematic things with Garvey, but what Garveyism, and I don't say Marcus himself, but Garveyism, which is about the grassroots, which is about, you know, mm -hmm. Africa for the Africans, which is about the building, you know, you have the different chapters which come together, et cetera. The model of Garveyism is actually the perfect model for how you build this, the kind of community we're talking about, even though Garvey himself was problematic. But actually Garvey, isn't, I mean, Garvey goes to prison in the 20s. Um, we, should, we shouldn't be thinking about, and this is part of the problem we do this, we think about history through the great men. We should think about the politics. You can take Marcus Garvey out of the, out of the UNIA. It's still, the UNIA is actually a radical space for these kind of discussions. Yeah. Um, but you have to engage in that and discuss that. And it's not, like I said, community is, is absolutely not perfect. And I am no way, shape, or form romanticizing community. But you have to have those discussions with, between, mm. the, and it's really, but it's really important to have that. And it's also really important because there are some really problematic things in the community, mm -hmm. right? So just sticking to the bubble, this is what we have done. And I've, so, so like I said, I'll give you, I won't give examples because of time, but ask me afterwards. <laughs> but um, like we'll have events where we bring in community and then people are like, oh, no, but they, they can't say this, they can't do that. We're like, no, you've got to do it, say that. And you've got to do that and you've got to challenge it. Mm -hmm. If you don't, what are, what are we doing, right? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's not simple at all. It's really, really complicated and problematic, but it's necessary work that we have to do. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you very much for your talk. It's been interesting just to hear what you have been saying about, you know, like decolonizing. Wondering, how do you colonize a country while speaking their say, their language? How else would you colonize a country? <laughs> well, let's you. Because the whole idea of <laughs> colonialism is they taught us their own traditions, language, culture, made it us think that it's what's theirs was far superior mm -hmm. to what we have mm -hmm. and and I can't see how we could use their own tools to actually change the mindset 
Yeah, so I think it's important. When I use the metaphor colonize, I don't mean in a European sense of colonization with racism and white supremacy and at all, right? What I'm saying is that we go into these spaces, we create, we carve out our space within it, we take the resources from it, and we use that to do the means that we need to use it for. I also stress that this is not something that we do in order to change anybody's mind. Like, I'm not going in, that's the whole point of the not saying decolonization. I'm kind of accepting that the place ain't going to change. But what I'm saying is that we have this community stuff outside, we've got organisation, we've got work, we've got stuff we want to do, and what we can do here is we can colonise in our way, our space, we can take resources out, we can take stuff out to put in service of community. And that, well not, I mean, not, not all community, but you know, that radical community, right? That's the not, not that we are replicating colonialism in the European sense, but we are, use, we are being very strategic in what we're doing to take the resources from the place. Um, and I also stress this, and that what I would very, very much say is that fundamentally, the university, I'll say this, the university isn't going to be the solution or part of the solution to the black struggle. The university is the problem. So what we're actually trying to do is to subvert the institutions that we actually work in. And we, we can do that by drawing the resources out of it. Does that make sense? Is, is what you're saying similar to Rodney's idea of the guerrilla intellectual? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, yeah. And then, and then after. Yeah, thank you so much for. So I'm from Zimbabwe, so it's good that you made two, three references about Zimbabwe. So thank you about that. Um, so my question is: in bringing down the house, the movie with uh, Queen Latifah, she has allyship mm -hmm. in the in in a white man. Where do you see the role of allyship in what you've just been telling us today? <laughs> yeah, so actually I actually had this whole conversation just today with the students because um, I was talking about the psychosis of whiteness actually, which is the next talk, the next book, so yeah, <laughs> which might give you an a answer to the question and what I say and what I always say with this question is I, I don't think about allyship and I mean that in a very real way in the sense of what black, the black radical tradition says, look, we need to do what we need to do and that's it, right? like I don't, I, I spend, really spend no time thinking about how do we bring allies in. What I have the edited this answer to is that a better concept than allyship is if a critical race theory talk about interest convergence and actually says that the only time you get change is when the interests of black people converge in the interests of those in power. Um, and that's what we should be talking about. Because I think about someone like black studies, for instance, we didn't get that because we had allies. We got that because uh, I was able to make a business case to the university and the people who signed up black studies, they're not allies, they're terrible. Oh my God, life, I was gonna, they're awful. In many, many ways they're awful but they signed it off because they saw it was in their interest to sign it off. Mm -hmm. So you don't need allies. You need interest convergence. Mm -hmm. And that's a very different project, mm -hmm. right? Which means you just, we just do what we need to do and get the people on board we need to get on board for the thing that we're talking about, rather than saying we need to have these people born as allies who are going to help us. That, that attitude is somewhere that doesn't really get us anywhere, I don't think. Okay, we have one there. Um, are there any online? Hi, thank you. Um, in the Portier, and um, I had never seen a lot of the films that they talked about, but there is this um, moment in Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, where he's having this conversation, I think it's with his father, and the character says, like, you think of yourself as um, a black man or a negro, and I think of myself as a man, and that moment is supposed to be some sort of revelation of... Um, an evolved way that people think about blackness. That you're, you're, and we see this a lot like in political conservative circles here in the, in the UK and the US and all of that. And I just wondered, um, you know, in the kind of work that you do, what are your thoughts on this idea of not thinking of yourself as black? Is this evolved way to think of yourself? Yeah, it's the worst possible thing you can do. Let's be honest, like, this is why I say black, this black studies, black everything, like, it's the... <laughs> <laughs> no, because think like blackness as a concept it's the it's potentially a radical concept right we look the way we look for a reason and it's really important to say that blackness and race are different race is a european concept which is about biology which is about genetics which is about superiority if you honestly believe that when white people europeans went into africa africans didn't look at them and go oh you're white then you're mad right like and part of the thing is that we don't believe that we can have our own theory Right, that if we're saying black, it must mean the same thing as white people mean. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. It has a completely different history trajectory, etc. So we can point out the color of our skin because this is, and particularly for those of Caribbean descent, but not just for us, this is the only thing we have that connects us back to ourselves. 
right? Because as I said, it was stripped up. My name is Andrews. That's not my name. Don't be ridiculous. Like everything, everything was stripped from us. And the only thing we have that connects us is our blackness, which is why it's such an important thing that we don't lose sight of. And why it is radical is because that means that we are connected. So we, I am connected to like mass incarceration. People in, in America are mass incarcerated in ways which are literally historically unprecedented. Also connected to the people drowning in the Mediterranean who are largely people from West Africa, economic migrants who are so desperate to get away from the poverty that they're, they're risking their lives across the Mediterranean. Also connects me to the child in Congo picking coltan, right? So if you embrace blackness, then what you're doing is you're embla embracing a position that connects you to the wretched of the earth. Why on earth would you not want to do that? The only reason you don't do that is if you want to delude yourself into believing that you're in the house. Then no, 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 blackness is the thing. No, 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 no. That's, that's the worst possible thing you can do is not see yourself as black. Um, we have one there um, in, in front. I'm just wondering, is there any online? Yes. A okay. four. After yeah. that, we'll go to the online <laughs> session. So. Thank you. I think that the talk reminds me of. Um, a discussion between um, Bell Hooks and Colonel West, um, Breaking Bread, in terms of the tensions between community and academia. And, I'm, and, and, and it also reminds me of um, Audre Lorde, Audre Lorde's um, um, The Master's Tools Will Not Dismantle. The, tool, the Master's Tools Will Not Dismantle the Master's House. And I'm just wondering if, Candy, that you think that um, your perspective it's kind of resonating with um, Audre Lorde, sister, sisters outside, sister outsider. It does and doesn't, right? So implicit in the master's tools, won't dismantle the master's house, is the idea that well, fundamentally, like fundamentally, like I said, the university is the enemy of racial progress. Like historically, presently, everything about it is terrible, right? So if we're saying like, where are we? If black liberation as a goal, then no, you cannot use a university, but I guess there's more space in this argument to say, actually, you can use some of those tools though, right? Like some of the tools within the uni that we're gonna colonize and we're gonna use and we're gonna draw the resources out of, you can use them. But it's how you use them which is really, really, really important. So I'm not necessarily saying you need to change the whole way that we do things. Some of the things you just do and you have to compromise and you have to kind of sell your soul a little bit in order to pull out some of those resources. So it's a kind of yes and no in that. Because we look, the reality is, we're in the West, you're going to use the master's tools. Isn't that the idea you're not is you have to. And the, but the question is, in what way do you use them? Right? The best way I always use is methods, so research methods. Right? So I do ethnography, which is horrendously racist <laughs> as a method, historically. Horrendous, honestly, it's terrible. But you can use ethnography differently. Right? Or quantitative research has been used in so many terrible ways, but you can use it differently. Right? So you can use some of the same techniques, but it's kind of how you use them is important. Right? And that and that and, and I think it's important to recognise that with the condition that we are in now, you're not going to be able to find anything and do anything that isn't some way tainted. That's where we are. Struggle where you are so that we can build something different. But fundamentally, we do need new tools and we do need new ways to go about things. Thank you. Um, we have some questions um, from our viewers online, and the first is: How can black pastors today follow Sam Sharp's example? Yeah, so I think, I mean, it's a different context now, right? Um, hopefully, <laughs> it's a slightly different context. <laughs> Although, I suppose it depends what denomination you're in, right? So, in fact, uh, I was talking to somebody earlier about uh, Canon Eve Pitts, uh, mm -hmm. who work, he's works in Birmingham and has done a lot in the Church of England to kind of talk about reparations, etc., etc. You know, Church <coughs> of England is, she's, she's, it's a nightmare. Like, you talk to her, it's a nightmare. Like, it's always a problem because you know what the Church of England is, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas you have other denominations which are, much more independent, right? Much, much more rooted in black tradition mm -hmm. and the black community. Um, but I think it's the same basic idea, right? That what, what are we doing? What, the, I mean, the black church, let's be honest, is the most advanced, developed, has the most money of any black institution in the community. It is, mm -hmm. right? And I, and I think a lot of the criticism you could make about the slave pastor would be for a lot of black churches, unfortunately. But what do we do with that? Like, is it just about the church and the church community? And are we putting those resources to work in service mm -hmm. of community? And I said the church is, a vibrant place, it's still a vibrant place, there's still lots of support, and, and, and we should be doing more to make sure that those resources are being put in the service of black liberation. And there is nothing stopping us, right? Like, if you, if you have the church community, you have, there's nothing stopping us doing it, we just need to decide that we have mm -hmm. to do it, right? So I want, I want to write off the church. In fact, as again, it's the most, talking about self-help and independence, 
the church is the place. So the question is, how do you radicalize the church? And there's no reason it can't be done. Yeah, no, that's... Um, we have a, another question, really, which um, says, do non-academics mobilize for action more than academics? Mm -hmm. I think no. I know what your answer is <laughs> no, going to be. No, no, but no, no, um, really. it's really important <laughs> for us to reflect on it, yeah. Yeah, no, I, no, I think the problem, the problem that we have in academia, broadly, is the problem more generally in society, is that over the last 50 years, because we went down a path which was how do we better integrate, how do we get into the, the better jobs, how do we do this, the, the activist space has declined, dramatically declined. Mm -hmm. So 50 years ago it was vibrant, British black power, now not really, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not, that academia, and because you don't have that vibrant British black power, it's not pushing the academics to be, you, we can get, Gilroy can get away with being Gilroy, right? Which hopefully that's changing now because of Black Lives Matter, because of the young, the young people are starting to get back involved. Um, but no, like I said, the plantation is, we're all on the plantation. Everything I'm saying about academia, you could say about pretty much every other mm -hmm. industry. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, and in some ways academia gives us a space and the mm -hmm. privilege to, 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 to re-engage and have those discussions that are more difficult if you're a nine to five. Right? Mm -hmm. And sticking to academia, um, there's a question on the impact of no platforming on black studies. Um, has it impacted what's... Uh, I, um, yeah. <laughs> I don't think, I don't, I don't know. This I is on we, campus. Yeah. We certainly don't get invitations, some invitations. Like, this is the thing with black people, you just don't get invited at all. So you don't know you've been no platform, you just never get the invitation. <laughs> 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 but I'd say, broadly speaking, it hasn't, it hasn't, I, don't, I, I can't say it's affected anything that we've done. Um, and I think the no platform thing is, is, a, is a missed thing anyway. Largely, I think it hasn't had that much of an impact. It usually only impacts people who are racist, sexist, homophobic, or mm -hmm. should otherwise not have a platform anyway. So. Yeah, I can take another question from the audience before I. Yeah, there's one um, up here. Uh, yes. Hi, Kendi. Um, thank you very much for the talk. Sorry, um, I've had many lectures here, so this one is me doing problem sheets. Um, my question was on when you spoke about being in a um, fortunate position where you can use your voice, you have access to the tools that can actually affect the community. Now that I'm working in a professional, in the financial industry, how do you advise young professionals like myself to really make use of the resources <coughs> around them and to really create a voice that can allow them to impact the communities that they are in as well, the communities that they want to create to see sort of like the black movements or even empowering those around us? Yeah, so look, it depends, like industry specific depends. I think this is why like, I, I like academia because you, you can do most things, right? Most things, you, you'd be surprised what you can do in academia. Is not necessarily the same case in every industry? But certainly what I would say and what I've learned over the last few years is that all these companies have lots and lots and lots of money for like EDI initiatives, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and they waste them on absolute nonsense. So I would recommend that you go and talk to say, look, you know, you've got this budget. Let's do something different with it. Let's actually do something interesting with it. Let's try and do something that's not just pay for some speaker to come in for Black Employment Month um, and give us a give us a talk. Let's actually try and can we use this to do something that's really going to impact the, um, the agenda outside, right? Because the budget, believe me, corporate, there is lots and lots and lots of money, right? Mm -hmm. And it's just being wasted. So that's what I would say is go to if you work in a place, go to them and say, look, let's use the budget differently, right? Use your resources differently. Use your and. You know, it, again, it depends on your industry, it depends there are more restrictions, etc. Et but there's absolutely no reason you can't do that with the, whatever company you are. And then also, you know, if you have skills that you can use, volunteer, right? There's organizations that need, that need stuff, right? That need help, that need support. And we have lots of these skills now, and we can use and put them in. Mm -hmm. So find an organization and volunteer. And that's the main, like for community organizations, the main, the main problem with community organization, there's no people to do anything. Mm -hmm. That really is the main, problem, the main problem. So if you have the, the time to do it, please do help go, and, go out and get involved because that's really important. That's a real, you yourself are a really important resource that can be put back into community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that leads on to a question, an online question. Are we making progress in the right places? <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no, so look, I don't want to be too negative because it's like we've got four black professors and, and William will, sure, will be a black professor. Yeah, that's <laughs> Uh, it's not bad, like it's not a bad thing. I don't want to say it's a bad thing. You should have more black professors, right? Yeah. You should have more um, yeah, black professionals. I, I don't think you should have more black Tories. I think we should probably have less. <laughs> <laughs> but, 
<laughs> no, Kerry Bannon is going to be the Prime Minister. It's going to be awful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so, no, no, I think, no. I think if I'm saying, like, what's looking... And this is what... Okay, let me embrace Malcolm for a second. Malcolm told us this would happen in the 60s. He mm -hmm. said, look, if you do this way of civil rights, you will get token integration. Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. is what we have, token integration, mm -hmm. where there's some few sprinkling of black people in high places, but actually look at the actual things. So look at uh, black employment rates. So the black young male unemployment rate is the same today as it was in 1981. Mm -hmm. It hasn't changed at all. Black women are four and a half times more likely to die in childbirth. That hasn't improved at all. Actually, look at the, uh, the income gap. Hasn't improved at all. Mm. And that's just in the UK. Look, globally, even worse. You know, the life expectancy of Nigeria that has a fifth of the African continent, actually, almost a quarter of the African continent, is 54. 54. And we're talking about progress? No, but no, no, there's no mm. progress. Actually, the key indicators, it's all terrible still. And all that's happened is a few of us have done, have done okay. Mm -hmm. So no, we're not making progress at all in the right direction. And mm -hmm. because of that, and the worst thing is because we have some people that have done all right, we're all starting to think that we're doing okay. And they actually don't have the organization. And that's what we, this is why it's worse now than it was in the back 50 years ago. Because 50 years ago, you had organizations, you had revolution, you had this, and they've all gone because we all think we're making progress. Kendi, thanks. Yes. Um, we've really um, been educated. You know, this is like a sort of a community, even in, within the space <laughs> of a university. So thank you very much indeed. Um, and yeah, I'm going to now invite uh, Rosemary Davidson. Actually, before I invite her, can we just give him a chair? He's made <laughs> a lot of effort. <laughs> Great. So, I mean, you must also be getting tired. Yes. Um, so we um, are going to close and um, go off for refreshments at Regents College. I'd like to invite um, Rosemary Davidson go to bed to give the closing, make the closing remarks. Rosemary. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Next time you read a book or read an article or listen to a discussion on television, this lecture will resonate and start connecting dots with you. If it hasn't already, start connecting dots with your own reading. Um, this is the tenth year of the Sam Sharp lectures. In 2012, oh, someone clap, that's cute. <laughs> In 2012, the 50th anniversary of the Jamaican, of Jamaican independence and also um, the Olympics. Um, in, a, in a room at the Jamaican High Commission, Professor Robert Beckford delivered the inaugural Sam Sharp Lecture. At the time, it was like, OK, so we got that one off and no one died and it was great. And I didn't quite imagine, hoped, but didn't quite imagine this, this year, where in 2022, 10 years later, year after consistent year, we have been able to produce for, or create and recreate a black space where our intellectuals, our theologians, our activists, in community and other spaces can talk about things that impact the wider diaspora of people of colour in this country. And it's always a privilege to be running up and down with the microphone <laughs> or just sitting in the audience and listening to it. And I just want to take the time, if you'll indulge me, to say thank you to a lot of people First, say thank you to the Jamaican High Commission, especially Joanne Thomas, who was deputy at the time in 2010, 2020, and 2012, who integrated the inaugural Sam Sharp lecture into their own celebrations, saying, you know, OK, you want a platform? We'll give you a platform. So we started off high, and it felt high. It felt important. The room was packed. The room was packed, right, Robert? It was packed. Never imagined, there was nearly 100 people there and it was 
and people were just really engaging. I think if Wale will remind me, if people came from Bristol and places like that, people got on a coach to come down to London for the first inaugural lecture. So say thank you to that support, that glimpse of a vision. <coughs> also to the partners, the consistent partners, because people come and go, right? The consistent partners of the Sam Sharp project, the Jamaican Baptist Union. We were not going to be able to pull any of this off without our, our brothers and sisters in, in Jamaica. And they are fierce and formidable and would not let us have anything less than the best and us, made us strive for the best. So we thank you. If you were watching, really thank you. I'm not going to cry. No waterproof mascara today. Can't cry. <coughs> also, the Baptist Union of Great Britain, the general sec there, front and centre, thank you. Consistently from day one. Um, Regents Park College, can we have a whoop? <laughs> <laughs> oh, there are a lot of you are dead. Regents Park College, another consistent supporter. And even when the support for these people, even when the support was uncomfortable, they stuck with it. Could have easily walked away. Well, maybe not so easily because we would have called them out on it, but <laughs> remained consistent, even when the seat was rather prickly. And also the Baptist Missionary Society as well. But the idea, my idea of having a an annual lecture to keep the Sam Sharp project on the radar for so many people. Any, any idiot can have a good idea. It takes committed people to take that idea over the line. And those committed people, some of, I don't think they're here, hopefully they're listening, have made sure that you've been informed and instructed and fed and, made, and hunted out for and supported stellar speakers year after consistent year. And they're behind the scenes. You probably never met them or you maybe already know them in a different context. So people like Mary Parker, who sends the invitations out, who probably thinks she's, you're, she's stalking you. She's not stalking you. She's just wanting to make sure that you knew that it's October, start making your travel plans. The Sam Sharp lecture is coming. Year after year, ensuring that the list is there, that you can sign up, and always, always a detailed, orientated person. We forget how important these people are. Mike Lowe, who year after year has been part of the tech what, you know, when we wanted to go live and go online, he was, he was, it was always a yes. And then he probably went, oh my God, I'm not sure. But every year, it was always a yes, which is why we've always been able to make this available to people, not just in this country, not just in one town, but across other countries as well, Jamaica, the States. Um, and we are very proud of that. But I'm going to make and highlight another person as well. Reverend Wale Hudson Roberts. <laughs> Those of you who know about the Sam Sharp lecture would also know Wale. You would have spoken to him. He would have had an email from him. If you've been in, he's organised and, and sourced all our lecturers, navigated and negotiated with venues. We've had some fabulous venues, that's Wale. We've, all, we've been able to source brilliant speakers, that's Wale. There have been some dramas behind the scene. <laughs> and I'm not... I, I, <laughs> I, I, am, I, am, I am... I'm not the girl to say oh, we've changed their minds on. I'm not that girl. I don't do it well. But Wale has been the unrelenting, consummate ambassador and tactician and diplomat to the 10th order every single year. 
we would not have the quality of lectures without his work consistently. On top of everything else that he does, Visions of Colour is just one of it. There are so many other pieces of work. So with your indulgence, I would like to invite Wale to come down here, please. And I'd like you to stand and thank him. Wale, come on. begging me let me go let me go <laughs> let me go but also the last thing in not least is that we have our lectures and they are so dynamic and successful because you come out you come out some of you have been coming out for the past 10 years relentless you've just been there can guarantee if I don't see you for the rest of the year I know I'll see you at the lecture thank you thank you for your support and your love and your input and your criticism as well as your encouragement it's what brings it's it's that it's that thing that brings the diamond up to its shine and you are very much part of that so thank you thank you thank you i'm going to let you go to get something to eat um, but i want to say that next year we will be no less than what we are today, or what we've experienced today. Next year, we will have Professor... You still awake there? <laughs> Professor Anthony Reddy, who will be delivering next year's um, Sam Sharp lecture. So I'm expecting you in Roehampton, which is London, somewhere in, in London. Still, it is sort of London, sort of kind of London next year to listen to his lecture and you will not be disappointed and I hope that you will uh, allow yourself to be challenged and stretched even further than you are today. Thank you, thank you for coming out, thank you for your support for the past 10 years, not just for tonight and I hope that for those of you for whom this has been your first lecture that it will definitely not be your last. Thank you very much. Thank you.